Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Front Matter podcast, I'll be interviewing Alexandru Jennat. Based in Manchester, Alexandru is an associate professor in the Social uh, Statistics Department at the University of Manchester. He has a PhD in survey methodology from the University of Essex and was a postdoc at the National Center for Research Methods and the Cathy Marsh Institute. His research and teaching focus on survey methodology, longitudinal data, measurement error, latent variable modeling, new forms of data, and missing data. You can follow him on Twitter at Janet underscore A and check out his website at alexjanet.com. Alexander is the author of the Limpa book, Longitudinal Data Analysis Using R. In the book, Alexander discusses longitudinal data analysis uh, in a very, very in-depth way, uh, but uh, in a very particular thing, he includes a lot of code in the book. So it's actually a very practical book for people who are learning to do longitudinal data analysis. In this interview, we're going to talk about his background and career, professional interests, his book, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience as a writer. So thank you very much, Alexander, for being on the Lean Pub Front Matter podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And you can call me Alex. Uh, I think Alex. that uh, whenever I hear Alexander, I feel like uh, I just, I've been naughty for some reason. It's kind of <laughs> what my mom says when uh, uh, things went horribly wrong. I know what you mean. There's two people in the world that are allowed to call me Leonard. Um, so I'll, I'll call you Alex going forward. Um, uh so uh, one thing I always like to do when I start these interviews is ask people for their origin story. Um, so I was t- wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you found your way into the career that you have. Yeah, thank you. I, I've been listening to a few of your podcasts and I thought, oh, this is, I have a very boring academic career. And then I'm like, oh, actually, it's, I'm not sure how typical it is. So I'm originally from Romania, so somewhere from the Northeast, uh, kind of relatively close to the border with Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova. Um, and then I did my bachelor in Bucharest, in the capital of Romania, in sociology. And uh, yeah, it was kind of a strange choice. I just went by elimination. I just went through all the things I didn't like, and kind of sociology was the the most interesting thing that was left. And actually, it was a, a really nice choice for me because, uh, yeah, it it's really fascinating. So when I got there, I I really got interested in in research, and I was really lucky. Because so since my second year as an undergrad, I was a research assistant. So I had kind of four years of kind of research experience in Romania, just uh, yeah, starting as an undergrad. And that was great. I mean, we did, unlike I think uh, maybe studying in Western universities, you do lots of different things. So, you know, from interviews with shepherds to uh, exit polls to uh, questionnaires with migrants in Spain and so on. So very diverse uh, experiences. And I really enjoyed research. So it was kind of clear I want to stay in academia. And I really was interested in, in statistics and data collection, and especially this idea of measuring. So we have in sociology, we like uh, big concepts like values and attitudes and things like this, but they are very hard to measure. And uh, it was kind of fascinating for me. How how can you measure concepts like this? Um, and, you know, I learned about different statistical techniques to do that. Um, and after that, I just, uh, some, some colleagues from Romania encouraged me to apply f- to study abroad. So I just applied for a scholarship and I was lucky enough to get it. And it was kind of a, a strange program. It was based in Belgium. The degree was in Belgium, but it was funded by the Luxembourg government. Uh, at that point, uh, Luxembourg didn't have a university, so it was actually based at the research center in um, in Luxembourg. And part of the time you're in Luxembourg, part of the time in Belgium. Uh, and it was in social um, policy analysis, which wasn't necessarily the thing I really was interested in. But how the course was just stats from really good professors from the Netherlands. I said, okay, I can learn some social policy if uh, on the way I, I learned some stats from uh, these great professors. So I did the, that degree. Then I had a gap year uh, where I, I lived in Germany for one year. Uh, while, and then I was applying for um, PhD programs in Germany and UK. I uh, received two offers from the UK and decided to go to University of Essex. They had a really good group there working with longitudinal data. Um, and uh, data quality, a thing that I was interested in. I spent three years there doing my PhD and then moved to Manchester. And I've been there since uh, postdoc, uh, assistant professor, then associate professor. So I've been here for um, yeah eight, nine years so far. 
Yeah, thanks very much for sharing that uh, really great story. It's um, I, I always love the sort of stories of I, itinerant scholars um, uh, and people who move around, uh, being having been formerly sort of to some extent been one myself. Um, uh, I guess one question I have to ask: I've got I've got a, a, an old friend from Romania. So you grew up under the Ceausescu regime when you were younger. Yeah, I mean, I can't really say so. I mean, I was born towards the end of the eighties, so I can oh, say, okay. you know, I can't experience can, can say I experienced a lot of that. I, you know, I do know a lot of the things that happened because of our family and also the nineties. They were different, but in some ways, but also not the best <laughs> probably years of uh, our country. So yeah, I know a little bit about it, and you know, I know stories of you know my parents queuing at three in the morning to get food and things like that. Uh, but I can't say I, I lived for it. Yeah, no, okay, okay. Thanks, thanks very much for uh, for sharing that detail. Yeah, I know um, people from that my uh, my my family, you know, is from U Ukraine region, and we all we all have stories of conflict and, and things like that, even if we haven't experienced them ourselves. But they're they're kind of there in 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 all of us. Um, uh, and so, actually, one one sort of fun question to have, I guess, is um, uh, before we get onto sort of the serious matter of your your scholarship and your and your book and things like that, uh, what was it like moving to the UK? Was it a culture shock? I mean, I it guess you'd been, you'd been you'd been around already, so yeah. I mean, it's kind of interesting uh, how yeah countries are similar and different. I remember, I think the first year I've been here, I was just complaining half of the time because there were things <laughs> I got. I was used to it. I didn't understand how they couldn't travel over the channel. I figured, okay, I mean, it's not such a big difference. So how, uh, and I remember, I don't know, things like bread or cheese or things like that, which you would see in Germany and Belgium and Luxembourg, all of this, they're kind of similar in the culture they have. Uh, and I just remember saying, oh, how, why is it so hard to find this, these things? Uh, and then you learn that, you know, you can find really good bread and cheese. You just, you need to know where to look. And I mean, it's just, uh, you kind of need to understand a little how how things uh, how things work. So yeah, there were lots of cultural things like this, and also I don't. For example, I found people in, and this might be kind of uh, stereotypes, like people from the Netherlands, for example, very direct, or people from Britain, kind of indirect. And often I was probably just not understanding what people uh, were telling me because I'm just kind of direct. So if you don't really tell me what you think that I I will not understand the subtle <laughs> things uh, from the tone or the indirect, uh, you know, innuendos. So, yeah, I think there were lots of uh, small cultural things like this. But it was really interesting because during my PhD, in my cohort, I think there were 10 of us in this Institute for Social and Economic Research. And I think only one of us was from the UK. Everyone else f was from somewhere else. So it was very international. Uh, I remember our, the next cohort, everybody seemed to be from Latin America for some reason. So it was, we were kind of in a bubble. So, you know, there were, uh, you know, universities are this kind of strange places where uh, you are in a country and you, in a sense, you're not in that country uh, to some degree. So, yeah, I, yeah, I, there were, you know, colleagues from Belgium and from uh, other parts that like, uh, we, we could complain together about all the things that we took for granted and uh, weren't so easy to find here. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's really great. Uh, speaking of the indirectness, you reminded me of a funny personal story when I moved to London with a friend and a couple of friends in 1999, dates me. Um, uh, we had a very small apartment and we needed an, an extra bed. Um, and in in Canada, the name for like a kind of military collapsible camp bed is a bed is a cot. Uh, so me and my buddy went down to the local used furniture store and asked for a cot. Um, and the person looked at the English person who ran the store looked at us and said, "What do you mean?" And we said, "Well, we'd like a cot." Like, and he said, he "said What for?" We said, "Well, to sleep it." And he said, "Well, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? How big of a cot do you need?" And we said, "Well, like a man sized cot." Um, and he just looked at us and said, very indirectly, this isn't that kind of store. Um, so for anyone watching or listening, uh, caught in the UK means like a baby crib. <laughs> so we, we'd gone to this used furniture store ask, asking for a man-sized baby crib to sleep in. And no one would tell us di directly what, what yeah. they thought we were actually asking for. Um, and yeah, so there's a lot of sort of, a lot of learning you have to do. Um, and, you know, there's also sort of like, you know, whenever you move anywhere and you encounter other other foreigners, there's a lot of complaining. But any place, 
that has so many foreigners in it who are there to learn uh, and there to study and there to contribute, particularly in, in you know in academia, is a very welcoming and 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 great culture, uh, which the UK definitely has. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't have survived here for so long if it wasn't the case. And yeah, I think academia in UK really is still a, a very nice place to be. Lots of opportunities, lots of amazing people. So um, yeah, I and I think it's just wherever you go, it's it, it takes a while to just kind of adapt, uh, even with the weather and you know other things that you get for granted. How houses are built, you know how. Uh, the things that are in toilets that you don't expect, uh, I don't know, having separate cold and what, uh, cold and hot uh, taps in the uh, bathroom, for example, that was, I remember being uh, shocked by this for a long time. Do you know? Do you know the band The Eels? No, no. They they have actually a song about that. Um, like you know what? I'll, I'll I'll try to remember to put it in in the in the show notes. It's called Hot 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 Cold Cold Cold. Um, it's very funny. Yeah. Um, uh, but yes, for anyone who's traveled to the UK knows about the, the one hot tap and the one cold tap. Um, but, uh, yeah. And, and the sort of like arbitrariness of British plumbing. <laughs> uh, it's, it's like an adventure game, uh, every time you go. Um, but, uh, but, but also sort of, you know, very, very, very sort of fun in its own way. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so, uh, you, um, uh, we're interested in measurement, um, uh, and did so, you know, social science and stuff like that. And, um, I, I guess I've got sort of a general question that I think a lot of people, um, might have when, if they caught the opportunity to talk to someone like you, which is, uh, how can you really kind of be so sure that the say survey data that you gather and your interpretation of it is accurate? So I think maybe you're you're asking the wrong person. So I'm a, I'm a methodologist. So kind of my training is to just find problems with all the data. It's like literally this is the thing that I'm tra- the, what I published. Like oh another problem, another problem. So I can give you a very long list of issues. Uh, I can say that you know the, there are some things in which we can test our predictions. So I don't know. One classical example is can we predict. Uh, elections and sometimes you know we get it wrong, but for a lot of times we get it we get it right. There are some things where it's very it's very hard. So if I say okay, uh, you know we have this measure of human values, and I say I you know I ask you, I give you maybe ten or twenty questions, and based on those twenty questions, I can say what kind of values you have. And it's very hard to validate that. If I say oh you're a six point five on the scale that we made up. You can't really contradict me because we made up the scale, and you know, six point five is our best approximation. But there are some things where, so one one type of research that I'm really interested in is kind of looking at different sources of data, and just kind of trying to understand the issues with all of them. So, for example, in a project with colleagues from criminology, we're looking at official crime measures versus crimes from survey as they're reported by respondents. There's this whole long literature knowing that you know the 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 official crime uh, rates can be wrong because people you know don't go to the police or some are not recorded and we trust the surveys more. But the, we also have you know 60, 70 years of literature showing that surveys are not perfect. There there are issues with surveys, and kind of I don't. My take is all of them are incorrect to some degree and. Uh, as survey methodologists, we're just always trying to improve. So a lot of the work I do is like criticizing data, but also trying to figure out, okay, how can we correct for this? And one strategy is just always to improve the way we collect data, you know, understanding, okay, uh, there are techniques to see if people misunderstand questions. So we would do interviews or we would ask people to say, what are you thinking about when I ask you this question? And uh, that way we try to improve the way we ask people questions. Uh, other approaches are kind of statistical ways to correct for it. So, for example, I could compare the official statistics in uh, in uh, crimes and the survey data, and then try to see: okay, can we combine them? Both of them are imperfect. Can we get s- somehow closer to to the truth by combining them and using some statistical models? So, a lot of I have lots of colleagues that you know are expert in data collection and understanding all of these issues. And trying to have the best uh, questions, the you know the best ways to invite people in the survey, and then you have these statisticians that kind of are trying to uh, 
uh, after we get the data to correct for measurement uh, error and other types of errors. And what's really kind of fascinating about this field is it's very interdisciplinary. So you have, you know, psychologists that work with the development of questions. You have people that, you know, do, uh, you know, apps or the design of the interface for surveys. You have statisticians, you have sociologists. So it's very interdisciplinary. So, and when you go and talk to colleagues, it's like they, they can come from different uh, perspectives to look at uh, the same problem. And I think that's, that's where it's really exciting. Even like, I'm never going to say, you know, survey data is perfect or this data is perfect, but I can say, you know, like we have a community that is trying to figure it out and trying to do the best that we, we can do, you know, given the resources we have. Yeah, no, that's, it's, it's, that's a fascinating uh, field. Um, and the challenges that you face in particular as a kind of like authority in that field um, are more than, than most would face because I mean, especially if you're, if you're someone who sort of challenges some to some extent, the sort of uh, certainty that sometimes people place on numbers when they see them in particular, um, you know, by saying like, you know, there's all these problems with the way that we do things. You can face particular challenges. I assume that there's sort of colleagues that you encounter um, who don't like the fact that probably you sort of like the first thing you do is say, well, here's all these problems with the data that we collected. Um, but I, that, that actually sort of I, I, every once in a while I ask kind of self-indulgent questions on the podcast, probably more than I should. Um, so let me ask you your question about terminology. I want to. Um, so, one thing I find endlessly frustrating is the way that people. I'm going to pick on psychology. Um, people in psychology will use terms like data and experiment and laboratory. Um, uh, when people use terms like that, most people when they hear them, they think of things like Bunsen burners and like temperature takers and stuff like that, right? So there's like what's the data on in my experiment? And it's like, I had a you know, beaker of water. I turned up the heat under it at room temperature at sea level. And then I added some salt to the water and I did the same thing and I got a different result. Uh, when people do things like put a marshmallow in front of a kid in a, in a room and sort of say they've done an experiment in a lab, it just drives me crazy like you haven't done anything remotely like what happened in the other scenario. Um, what can you do when it comes to sort of like things like, so, so, so for example, like in a lot of the work that you do is like survey. So it's like you're asking people questions and getting their answers. What can you do to sort of like um, explain to people what the difference is between measuring temperature and like taking surveys and when you're presenting sort of the results of your analysis that you've done? Yeah, I mean, I think partially just trying to get across the uncertainty that we have. I mean, partially, you know, people will, they can, when they give you very precise numbers, you have this illusion that, okay, this they know what they're talking about. It's, yeah, this average is 6.5.3, you know, uh, I don't know, happiness of people in whatever, in Manchester is 5.35. And like, well, is it really? I mean... I'm not really sure is that. And there are some ways to estimate that which are relatively simple. And even those are not presented like, you know, confidence intervals are a way to show uncertainty, but those are an underestimation. So those basically don't take into account all the issues, you know, my colleagues and me are working on like measurement error, the fact that not everyone is participating and so on. Um, so I, yeah, I think partially we need to be honest that, the, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. And then I say, we also need to like think, you know, if they are useful or not. So even, you know, given that we will, for some things, we will not be able to do the kind of experiment that you think, okay, it's not physics or chemistry or anything like that. And the question is, you know, is it good enough? And partially this is our discussion also with new forms of data or, you know, uh, how much money should you pay for different types of data? Well, it really depends what you're trying to do. If your question is, uh, okay, I want to see if people like this new type of yogurt. Well, okay, probably it's fine to go out the corner of the street and just pick 40 people and see, okay, this is fine. If you're trying to, you know, calculate unemployment and you're going to make policy regarding this, you want to be super precise. So maybe it's worth paying, you know, 20 million pounds to get that statistic and make sure it's the best possible, even if it's not perfect. So it's also, I think we need to put things in, in context. 
And there's lots of literature trying to use observational data and uh, get that causal relationships. And it's very hard. It's very hard because we we can do experiments in surveys. So we can say, okay, you know, a thousand people, we ask them in this way, or we give them a vignette and we ask them how they, we see how they react. And a thousand people get a different version. But again, this is a survey. It's not uh, observational. It's not, uh, you know, like a controlled environment. They could be, you know, maybe the interview is at their home. Maybe other people are present. Maybe, I don't know. There are different things that would make that uh, problematic to say, okay, that's a perfect experiment. Uh, but again, maybe most of the time that's useful enough and we're just trying to make the, the 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 most of it that we can. And partially, this is why things like longitudinal data are useful or there are lots of techniques out there, you know, like from instrumental variables, quasi-experimental design. So we have like an entire array where we're trying to use this kind of survey data or other uh, observational data and try to get causal uh relationships but it is it is complicated because of all these other things that are happening and also the fact that we're humans and you know it's it's very hard to predict uh or to yeah to just say uh yeah with a hundred percent certainty if you do this this will happen yeah I, that i i gotta say i really love that 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 really great and kind of nuanced answer i mean what you threw in there was you know the fact that a it's hard b it's not perfect and c we have to do it um, uh, and so it's really important to have people sort of tackling these things, even if, um, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of people out there who kind of, you know, don't draw attention to the fact that, you know, it's 6.25 because I defined it a certain way, not because that's the way it is out in the world. Um, uh, I mean, even though a lot of people sort of really want that to be true, that things can be that precise. It's not true that things can be that precise, precise, but we actually still do really need to do it. We need to do something. Uh, to base our policies on, to base our, you know, business decisions on about like sort of flavors of yogurt or what have you, but also, you know, crime policy and then and, and things like that. It's just really important to be doing something. Um, and when it co comes to doing things, it's super interesting. Um, one uh, one uh, talk I, I watched um, preparing for this interview that you gave on YouTube, you talked about the difference between surveys and then sort of, as it were, more modern things like digital meter data and a super interesting thing called data donation, which I hadn't heard about, which but which made sense as soon as I, as soon as you mentioned the GDPR. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about data donation and w what that is, and how how people like you use that 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 kind of uh, information to sort of do your research. Yeah, I mean this is really quite new, and like I'm very lucky to work with very good colleagues from the Netherlands and Germany that are experts in this. So. As a result of GDPR, which is this law in uh, in Europe uh, regarding data protection, basically all large organizations are obliged to make your data available to you as a user. Uh, and there are some rules about, you know, it should be readable, understandable. There are some rules, although each company can give data in their own way. So you can go to Facebook and Twitter, uh, WhatsApp, uh, and so on, uh, Google, to ask for your data, and you can download it and look at it. And uh, colleagues thought, well, it's very hard to get access to this data. So, for example, if I want to, uh, you know, do research and see if Facebook use uh, leads people to be uh, more right wing. Uh, ideally, I would have access to Facebook data, but we can't really get access to Facebook data. So what can we do? Well, we can use surveys, but we know, you know, people have issues remembering how many times they do things uh, and their issues with surveys. So one idea our colleagues had, well, Given that people can download their own data, how about asking them to donate their data to researchers? And I think this is really, really exciting because in a way this shows that users have ownership of the data. So it's their data and we know lots of companies make uh, money using data, using data in different ways. Uh, but users can use that data and they can give it to other people or they can, uh, you know, make it public or you know, delete it or do whatever they want with it. And uh, colleagues from the Netherlands are developing a platform where people can donate their data so they can download, let's say, Facebook data and say, okay, yes, I want to, do uh, to donate it to these researchers. And they upload, to, uh, upload the data to, to the platform and uh, they have a few things. So one, they can see the data. So this is already quite exciting. Do You don't need to be a programmer to see, okay, what does Facebook say about me? The platform will help you visualize and understand your own data. 
And then you can decide what data to share. So you can say, well, I don't want to share, you know, my conversation with my mother, but I'm fine to share, you know, how many times I logged in on Facebook or something like that. Or uh, yeah, if you can select what type of data to share. And even within that, you can delete some, you know, instances that you don't want uh, to share. You can also, these platforms also can, um, basically summarize or anonymize your data. So in that way, the researcher won't know. So if you share your WhatsApp conversation, there won't be any names there. There'll be person A, person B. Uh, and so in that way, uh, you have, uh, you know, privacy is, uh, is maintained. So I think this is really exciting. I mean, it, I think it's still early days and it's quite a lot of work for people to donate the data. It's, you, they need to go to their account, download it, upload it. Uh, but I think it's it's very, very exciting because it gives power to the user uh, to get the data and they learn, okay, this is my data. I can decide what to do with it. I can decide who to share it with. Uh, and I can see, you know, what's anonymized. I can get a report on this data. So I think it's a very exciting avenue. Uh, the problem is things can change. So we don't know, you know, if this will work in 10 years or... Uh, the, this is kind of the issue. Technology changes a lot, but so far I think this, you know, it's a very exciting uh, area for data, new forms of data for academic researchers. Um, your answer there got me thinking about something I had not planned to ask about. Um, but uh, a lot of one of the reasons that people do kind of surveys and sort of get data about people and stuff like that is to try and craft policy. So here's a big high level political question for you. Do you think China, which has no such restrictions as the GDPR, um, has an advantage in crafting social policy over Europe now that Europe has something like the GDPR. And by the way, I'm not asking you to sort of like, this is your official kind of thing. I'm just springing this question on you. But what do you think about that sort of high level question? Does, it, does an authoritarian country that can take all the data it wants from people have an advantage over crafting social policy over a country that sort of protects people? Or, or region like Europe, like Europe does. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about that. Um, I think it's a trade-off, right? So it's a trade-off. People having the power over their own data, in a sense, it's hard for us to get data for researchers, even for academic researchers. You know, like we might have response rates of you know ten, twenty percent, thirty percent in a good survey. That means seventy percent of the people we asked don't participate. Uh, in a data donation study, maybe, you know, 80% of the people will not be willing to donate their data. Uh, and then the, I think this is a kind of a value uh, question. Is it our data is worse, but then people have the power, you know, to decide about their data, about their privacy. And in Europe, maybe we decided that's, you know, a fair trade. Even in the US, if you think, okay, you don't have GDPR, so these companies maybe have access to more data, they can link more data. Uh, and then we say, well, yeah, those companies maybe will be more performant, they have more data, they can do more advanced things, but maybe the users uh, have a disadvantage, they're losing some of their privacy. And I think, you know, societies kind of need to decide, okay, where are we on this continuum of kind of individual freedoms and privacies versus, you know, large institutions from companies to government just having access to everything. And there are, even in Europe, there are countries, you know, like the Scandinavi uh, Scandinavian countries, they have amazing admin data. They know, you know, they, they all the health records, address, all of these things uh, are, are available. Uh, they're not public, but in principle, researchers can use them, for example. You know, you can literally get access to data on everyone, I don't in Norway and Sweden to do to do analysis, and yeah, that's a trade off they're happy with. So they're happy, for example, to have that in UK. They you know there's no ID, for example, or they can't agree on having a, a unique ID for each individual. And this is kind of the the agreement in this country regarding you know privacy and what's important to them. So even yeah, I, I say it it depends a lot, and also it's kind of this culture. So I would say in the Nordic countries in Europe, there's more trust. So they're fine for the state to have this data and they trust, okay, they're going to have good ownership of the data. They're not going to sell it. We're not going to, you know, find it on uh, Pirate Bay or something like that. Uh, while in other 
places it's more like the wild west it's like everybody gets as much data as you can and you know make the most of it until i don't know somebody sues you for example <laughs> uh yeah no no it's 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 super no the thanks that really great answer i mean and it is it is interesting how cultural these things are um uh res with respect to trust and things like that but also you know how like you know companies or governments can often think that like oh we've got the data so we know what the reality is and then you hear the stories for people on the ground who are like oh like this is this is an old story from like my my you know basically the the app i use sort of made a wrong conclusion about me based on my usage so i'm going to use it differently now to give it to give it so so that it gives me the right ads or something like yeah. that uh, and so like, you know, there's, there's, there's always kind of interaction and back and forth and iteration going on on the user side, as well as the sort of provider side. And so people who think that they've got this sort of, you know, clear picture of what's going on, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as a yeah. clear picture when you're playing with people. Yeah. I mean, a really nice example, I think, you know, there are some insurance companies that, uh, they track your activity and then they change the premium based on your activity and you can buy a device, you know, online that will, uh, make steps on your phone or your device. It will just move. <laughs> so it appears that you're, you have steps. So it's like, okay, if you don't have trust and you don't, you're followed, then you're going to do all this kind of stuff, right? You're just going to find a solution to this and you're giving them the data, but then you trust it less. While I think in a place like the Nordic country where it's like a social contract and you think, okay, I trust you and you can hold this data, uh, probably, you know, people are not making stuff up or, you know, lying to the government just so uh, they have the wrong records. So yeah, people can be quite creative if they know they're, you know, they're followed or, uh, and they want to get around it. Um, I think there are solutions for that usually. Yeah, no, no, definitely. That's uh, that's curious. I hadn't heard about that one about adding steps, but it completely makes sense. Um, uh, and and but also sort of shows how how sort of like real world these kind of like the kind of work that you do, uh, is you know that like it is the basis for like you know your insurance policy, uh, is you know surveys and data, and things like that. Uh, so on that note, just moving on to talk about. I mean, I could talk with you about like all of these sort of like sort of super interesting things for a while, but to just go on specifically to talk about your book. Um, uh, so what is longitudinal data? Oh, and that's interesting because you're, you're saying about, you know, in different fields, I know psychologists discuss about, you know, experiments and they think of experiments in a certain way. And, uh, that's interesting with longitudinal data because also people in different fields talk about longitudinal data in different ways. And it's, I literally need to start the course and say, okay, this is my definition. So just, you know, to make sure that we understand each other. And the definition is very simple. It's like we have multiple observations from the same individuals. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and in that definition, a lot of things uh, become virtual data. Uh, social media data is longitudinal. I can observe you multiple times, your tweets or, you know, your posts. Uh, administrative data is longitudinal. So I have your employment history, for example. Uh, survey data can be longitudinal if I ask you, you know, this year and next year, the same questions. Uh, so. Actually, a lot of sensor data is longitudinal, for example, because I have, I don't know, I have a sensor that measures if, you know, somebody is crossing the street, uh, I don't know, uh, somewhere in Manchester, that's longitudinal because I have multiple observations. Uh, so it's actually a very big umbrella term. And that definition is important because the type of models I discussed, they need that kind of data, but they don't care if it's a survey or social media or something else. They just care, okay, there are multiple observations from the same elements. They can actually be businesses or something else. They don't have to be individuals. Uh, in the social sciences, typically they are individuals, but yeah, they can be something else as well. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, so uh, specifically in the kind of things that you're, that you're talking about, it's kind of like um, uh, you design surveys to sort of sample people over the same the same individuals over time if you can yeah yeah so there's a i mean we have most of the surveys we call them cross-sectional so we just do a survey with a person at a particular point in time and that's it so if we do polls mm. before elections we will just select i don't know a thousand people interview them and that's it but there is this group of surveys that are soon surveys uh and they're really important i mean they're in the eu for example there's the eu silk that literally the statistics from from that study decides, you know, how many of uh, the funds that different countries get yeah. or if they meet certain, you know, criteria. Yeah. Um, and 
there are some things you can only do with that kind of data. So if I want to see uh, how Bob changes in time, you know, I see, I want to see, you know, what's happening with this individual, I need to observe him at multiple points in time. Um, and you need, this data is actually quite hard to collect, it's expensive, it's time consuming, but there are some things you can only do with this kind of data. So most countries have some kind of large longitudinal studies because it's important for policy and uh, so, for example, in economics, often they use it to make histories of employment. So in order to know if somebody is employed or when they get fired, when they get a new job, well, I need to observe them for a long period of time. Otherwise, uh, I don't really, it's very hard to get this history. And so, yeah, that actually, that's a, just so many questions. But um, uh, so, like, for example, when you say it's expensive to get this data, does that mean that, like, for example, people get paid to participate in studies? Yeah, so in most studies, and I work with a lot of large longitudinal studies that are, you know, funded by research councils, for example, uh, there's this idea of kind of a fair, uh, have a fair payment for people's time, right? So these studies, uh, are usually they last around the, an hour, the interview, but there are some studies in the US, the HRS, maybe not now, but sometimes they would last four hours. And you think, well, somebody's giving four hours of their, of their life for you. Uh, and they need to get, we call it an incentive. Um, and you can also think, yeah, it's just kind of a fair payment for their contribution uh, and for their time. Uh, smaller studies, sometimes maybe they don't have incentives or they're smaller, uh, but I think in large studies, large some studies, there is an expectation that, okay, the respondent needs to get something for, for their time. And um, um, again, to get specific about your book, so where does coding come in and R? Yeah, so you can't really do statistics without coding. So you kind of need coding to some degree. You you do have software that is point and click. So maybe you don't really always need to write code, but it's recommended to have code so you know your work is reproducible uh, and so on. And basically, you know, since I was undergrad, I learned how to code to run to do statistics. And it's kind of an expectation that okay, if you want to do more advanced things, then you need to to learn to code. Why R specifically? Uh, well, one is open source and it's uh, very popular. It's a very large community and probably for statistics is one of the most popular software out there. Python is very popular, but probably less so for statistics. So it's kind of R, I would say, is the go-to tool for, for statistics. Um, and I would say even if people, I don't know, offer at least uh, in sociology, when I studied, often people were in sociology because they didn't want to do math or stats or, you know, coding. But if you want to do any quantitative analysis, then you need you need these things, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on who you ask. Um, and yeah, I think R probably is one of the best tools you can use because it's open source. It has a very large community. Uh, you know, I can go and teach it in Africa and people can just download it. I, they don't need to pay for a license. Uh, they can, there are lots of free resources online and so on. So, um, yeah, I would say almost anyone who wants to do any kind of quantitative analysis, they need to learn uh, coding. Probably R is a pretty good tool out of those that exist out there. Um, and uh, your book is currently marked on LeanPub is 80% complete. Um, uh, and I just uh, in the last part of the interview, we talk about sort of the the guest sort of uh, work as an author and how they approach writing their books and things like that. Uh, so, do you plan on ever making it a hundred percent complete? Is this a sort of like forever book that you're always going to be updating? What's your case? Yeah. writing and publishing new chapters. Just if you could talk a little bit about your approach to the the project. Yeah, I'm a little torn. I have this list of all the things I want, and I, you know, I use uh, I use kind of a Kaban system where I just track all the stuff I want, and I, I have more and more things that I move to this, uh, you know, maybe edition two or, uh, you know, I wish I would do these things. So ideally, I do want to to finish it and to kind of, you know, say, okay, we have a hundred percent for now, and then in the future there might be a second edition or I might work on it. I do think there is, it's good to, to have a, you know, to, to feel that you finish something and move on. That being said, you know, uh, one of the reasons that I use uh, LeanPub was this idea that you can update the book because the code in R changes quite a lot. So the things that, you know, this year 
uh, I have in the book, maybe next year doesn't work anymore. And one of the advantages of using the platform is that, okay, I can update the book so people can just download the latest version and the code will work. Um, so in that sense, if I want to keep it up to date, I do need to continue working on it uh, from from time to time at least. But there are lots of things I want to add. I have a, I have a list, but I also have a deadline. So I hope next year to say it's a hundred percent, and partially because I also want to you know to to have a printed version of it. So mm -hmm. that kind of forces me to to have a, a end <laughs> in sight. Yeah, that's really great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, it's um, it's curious. Um, there there are sort of lean pub authors who are like kind of like, um, they like one one author in particular. I remember like he sort of had his book at ninety nine percent complete, and he wanted to leave it there forever. But then he got people going, "Why don't you ever complete the damn book?" And he's like, "Well, I I put it at I leave it an incomplete because I want to be continually adding to it. I think it's my form of." generosity and engagement with the audience but then there's people who are like well now you're 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 cheating me because you're not actually finishing the book um and so this concept of a sort of publishing an in progress book can have like a sort of interesting back and forth uh between the sort of authors authors and readers and things like that so people can be like yeah. why is your book still incomplete and it's like because i'm still adding to it all the time why why would you complain about that uh but of course you know there's there's communication issues and things like that and then and then as you're mentioning, it's sort of the idea of a volume two and things like that. How does that, what's the difference between a second volume and adding something to an existing book and things like that? It's just sort of interesting challenges, but communicating about it yeah. is just the most important thing. Yeah, I think uh, at least some of the readers I have, they were yeah slightly confused about that because they saw it's 80% and like they said, okay, so I can't get it in a way or like, I'm not sure if this is available and they see all right. the chapters and... Right. Are these the chapters that are available or are these the chapters that you wish to have when it's a hundred percent? Yeah. Uh so yeah, maybe we can communicate that better. And also, yeah, when some people just are not used to the concept, they just know, okay, the book is either out or it's you know, it's a dichotomous thing. It either existed or it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's it's actually I one thing I can say it's like sort of a sort of insider view from having done help people publish uh in progress books for over ten years now at Lean Pub. We used to get a lot more questions about what it means for a book to be partially complete uh, than we do now. Uh, most people mm. kind of get it. Um, uh, they still have questions, which is great. And we try and foster communication between authors and readers and stuff like that. And, you know, putting your email address in the introduction to your book and saying, contact me with typos or what have you is a really, is a really important way of doing that. Uh, but we do get a, a lot of, uh, like a lot more people than used to sort of get the idea of like, oh, okay. Uh, but yes, the, being very clear, for anyone who's made it to this part of the interview, <laughs> there are people who actually skip to the end to sort of hear about these kind of details. But um, if you're publishing a book in progress, if you've got a table of contents, being very clear to TBD, <laughs> uh, you know, um, uh, is a very important thing to add uh, so that people don't get sort of confused or disappointed if they download your book and they're like, oh, you know, that chapter that I saw on the table of contents actually isn't written yet. Um, you know, and in, even in including like sort of putting like if you have a plan for like this will be out at certain times, stuff like that, even just sit, like putting something like that just gives people confidence that you're there's an author on the other end of this who's thinking about it, knows what they're doing and has plans uh, can be a very important part of uh, in progress publishing. Um, the last question I always like to ask on the interview if the guest is a is a lean pub author is um, if there was one thing that had you shake that has you shaking your fist at lean pub going, damn you lean pub. Why can't you fix this stupid bug or problem? Or if there was one magical feature we could build for you, what would you ask us to do? Yeah, so I'm not sure if I'm using everything, you know, the the full Lean Pub system because I mostly create my, you know, PDF and uh, ebook and then I upload them. So for the most part, I suffer. Me and R together spend lots of time, you know, <laughs> trying to deal with all the nitty gritties about creating a nice PDF and. Uh, in book, so in that sense, you know, I actually don't do a lot of things on on the website except uploading and putting some descriptions. But there are some things, and maybe because uh, a big part of my audience is from academia, so a lot of people ask, "Well, can we access to access this through the universities?" And I try to explain, you know, like it's a different system. It's kind of I don't know. I tell them, think of it like software. So you get access to the software, you get access to future updates. Um, but I think it would be, and I had, you know, libraries ask me, asking me, you know, how how can we get access 
to this for our you know students or people at our university. And I think it would be good if you, I'm not sure if you have plans for that, if it would be a possibility to have kind of institutional access, because there are publishers that do that, even if, you know, they have access to some books or for some periods or for, I don't know, there's, I don't know, I guess systems in which you can set that up. But I think that would be for people coming from academia, uh, that would be quite good. And then, yeah, uh, let's say institution has access to a, for a year and then this many people can can download it or access it. I'm not sure if you thought about that. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much for bringing that up. Um, it is something we've thought about. Um, our, our sort of like longstanding policy is like if uh, a library is interested and we, we do get contacted all the time by libraries, particularly academic libraries and stuff like that. Our answer is contact the author. Um, mm. And and they can do it. It's a self like LeanPub is a self publishing platform. Authors own their own copyright. They own their own work. Currently, our position with library purchases is like contact the author and ask them. Uh, they can make the arrangement with you. Um, to to get to the very sort of in the weeds about this, a LeanPub books are can be updated at any time, which blows up librarians' minds. Um, uh, you know, they very much like for things to be done and acquire them and put them in their collection. Uh, and the idea that it can be changed just this just like they often they, they they might be interested in it as individuals, but as people who are in institutions, that's a very difficult thing to deal with. Uh, not and not just like from their own perspective as like sort of archivists or whatever, but like you know there there might be someone who's like you know you can imagine two students who download a book at different times and have different copies, and then a professor who's in the class saying go to page twenty two and they're like that's a different page for both of us you know what what do you do and then everybody's pointing fingers at each other um for like what went wrong so there's there's that that sort of complication uh, which of course is resolved by having everyone have their own lean pub account have their own copy of the book in their lean pub account and being able to download it and go oh we can solve this problem right now everybody sign in and download your book um so having a lean pub account is actually the primary way of making sure everybody has access to the same edition but that sort of doesn't work really well with kind of institutions um, unless they have a single point of download for every user. Um, the other thing is that, and this is very, this is the sort of me talking, not lean pub talking. Um, libraries don't really pay authors a lot and be blunt about it. Um, like they might, they might want, I, I love libraries. Libraries are a part, part of my life, my academic life in in the past and things like that. But you know, they'll want to pay an author 50 bucks for their ebook. You know, and it's like, if you're, I think most authors should take the deal personally, but a lot of them mm -hmm. don't want to do that because they're like, what, like, so 50 bucks and now a hundred thousand people can read my book. You know, that yeah. that's, you know, that's not a very good deal. And so that's one of the reasons that we actually sort of leave it up to the author to decide because it's up to, it's there's some people who are like, my mission is to have as many people as possible read my book. Um, other people are like, you know, that's just not that's just not fair. Um, so we leave it up to individuals. But we may someday have a kind of like blanket library policy where we take care of it for authors. It would definitely be an opt-in kind of thing, I would say, at least in, in this moment. Uh, again, because of those issues of kind of fairness and uh, mission and purpose that individuals have. Um uh, and and again, there's the sort of the sort of very important matter of coordination. Um, when it comes to academia, in particular, for example, citation is a is a specific problem <laughs> that lean pub books have, uh, where the page number can change, the quote can change, everything in the book can actually change, uh, which is in a sense no different than sort of citing a web page, for example, which is more or less a solved problem in academia. But uh, yeah, they're just sort of very interesting issues. Again, the sort of short answer is. It's up to the author, but um, yes, we do get contacted by libraries all the time asking about lean pub books, and um, hopefully someday there will be more convention around this kind of thing uh, that will make it easier to deal with. Well, uh, Alex, uh, thank you very much for taking some time out of your out of your evening um, to talk to me and to talk to our audience and all of us. And thank you very much for using Lean Pub as uh, the platform for uh, your really great book. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks.